Hello, welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week, we're talking about Season 2, Episode 10, titled Back in the World. It premiered December 6, 1985. It's written by Terry McDonald, who, I have to say right out of the gate, I'm not a fan of this episode. And when I say what else he did will make more sense why this may not be the best written episode. He would later serve as the executive producer on Sports Illustrated's swimsuit shows. (laughs) Known for their writing. (laughs) <laughs> yes, just known for oh, the great yes. writing. <laughs> the director of this the episode step up in his career. <laughs> the director of this episode is none other than the Don Johnson, and so we know that um, historically Melissa can fill us in as a Miami Vice and Don Johnson expert. <laughs> he seems to be quite enamored with the Vietnam War, and there's no coincidence that he's directing an episode that includes significant footage of the Vietnam War. Yes, he's very a staunch uh, opponent of the Vietnam War. And I'm not sure what it has to do with him. Like, I don't want to say for sure that he was drafted or I don't know. I don't know the story. I just know that he's like that, that, that those stories were his idea. Those episodes, mm. there's several episodes where they talk about the Vietnam War and it goes back and, and the storylines in there. And those were his idea, like his babies. So, so I have as we go through the episode. I have a few questions about if he's such a fan of the Vietnam War, his knowledge of of army stuff and we <laughs> can get that, into that's that a little different <laughs> yeah well we we could get into that going into the episode before we get started with chicken and see what's going on in each other's lives and guys i have to start off this way it's in sad news we wrote we, we record this show on sundays and this morning we found out that bill paxton died overnight and we have to mention him here since he did make an appearance in miami vice in season three episode 10 yes he did that's a great episode too by the way an amazing episode. Yeah. Yeah. And I saw something when I found out this morning about his passing. The only person that was in the Aliens, Predator, and uh, what was Terminator. the other one? He's Terminator. He's in Terminator. franchises. I, I think he's got to be one of the kings of sci-fi. I mean, there's mm-hmm. no way you touch the three biggest franchises in, in a genre and, and that what you do. Yeah, no, it was it was quite surprising because you've seen it's, – it's especially when you look at his – filmography you know the big ones you know aliens and apollo 13 and um you know his big movies but then you start to read his filmography and you realize like man i have seen 40 movies i've seen 40 bill bill paxton movies that's crazy. yeah i know it's insane yeah i mean i want to say he was uh like 90 plus so let's get on and talk about this episode which was it's it's kind of a sad episode but it's, I would say it's the Miami Vice Apocalypse Now episode because it's kind of like a clone of Apocalypse Now. So let's get over there and go talk about this episode. Okay, guys, we open up. This has got to be the, the oddest Miami Vice open. And it's not, we've had weird openings. We've had big openings. We've had great openings. This one, it's essentially all B roll newsreels of the Vietnam War, right? Of like refugees escaping from the Vietnam War, right? Yes. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Yeah, and, you know, you're used to seeing this stuff in more movies and in period pieces. And I was totally cool until the point in which they pushed the helicopter into the ocean. And then I was <laughs> like, was what are we watching? Strange. Yes, that was very strange. I don't know. Have you guys what... never seen that footage? It's because they they do it on purpose where they're where there are people like protesting and they're angry and they push the um, the Americans equipment oh. when they're getting out of they're getting out oh. of Vietnam. You guys have never. That's what that well, was. That who, who that use the forklift. That's what that that footage is about. It's like they're angry, and it's the the Americans are leaving. They're just getting the hell out of there, basically. Ah, uh, gotcha. And so they're okay. And, the, and a lot of the time, well, or 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 it was either they were angry, or the military was like, "We ain't taking this helicopter that don't work with us. So let's push mm-hmm. it in the ocean." <laughs> that makes more sense then, because the footage that they're using it is like newsreel footage, but it's it's like the last days of yeah, the war because yep. Exactly. It shows it shows the text Saigon 1975. Mm-hmm. So people are running there. The military is leaving. They're taking refugees with them. Yes. And it's just all this like newsreel footage that's happening mm-hmm. until the very end. We see two men come so, walking down below deck. And at first, I wrote him down as a soldier and his and his captain. I didn't recognize that it was Sonny Crockett. How could you not recognize that so, man? <laughs> <laughs> so when I saw Sonny, the first thing that I thought was. Why is he working on an aircraft carrier? I thought he was Army. Like, shouldn't he be 
out in the field, like so. But that makes sense that because they were leaving, since they were yeah. all leaving, yeah. Mm-hmm. So that I was so confused of what was happening, I wasn't even paying attention. I didn't notice until the very end that it was sunny. And what it is 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 as we find out later, a man named Stone, Ira Stone, has taken him down below deck. He shows him uh, there's body bags from people who have been killed in action. He opens it up and shows Sonny that inside of the bag, in with the dead body, is wrapped heroin that's being smuggled back into the U.S. Yes. (laughs) Inside of bodies. (laughs) Yeah. And it's inside of some guy named Shepard. And Crockett is, he's really broken up. He's like, I knew him. I knew this man. What what gets me about it is I've seen this concept in a lot of cop shows. Like, oh, they use the coffins. It's always the coffins for smuggling Mm -hmm. drugs. I've never seen the body bag one. I thought they always shipped them in coffins with the. No, because there was too many. Or is that like a new thing? That's there's too many bodies in the Vietnam War. They couldn't. Mm -hmm. They couldn't afford to have a bunch of caskets. So Mm -hmm. I mean, if they could, they would ship it in bags like that, so they could. I mean, it sounds awful, but so they could have more room to stack them and stuff. Plus, it'd be too expensive. All those coffins. Yeah. No, it's just I never thought about it. It's such an odd opening because we go from just all this newsreel footage to this very brief section where you see Sonny, where Stone showing up that drugs are being smuggled back in on this boat. Sonny just leans back, misty eyed. I knew him. I knew him. Like referring to. Shepherd, he's way really broken up that his body's being used that way, and then we go to the opening credits, and so that's what I mean by it. it's really it was really odd. It it didn't feel like like a Miami Vice open, I guess. I think that's why you thought that um that that the episode was so rushed because right mm-hmm. from the beginning they just throw a bunch of stuff at you. Right, there's all this stuff that you have to like take in. All you know that there's a body and it's got drugs in it, and then you're like, wait a minute, that's Sunny. Wait a minute, <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is wait a minute, this is Miami Vice. <laughs> this is not a, a documentary about Vietnam. What is going on? I will admit, I thought when I saw Ira Stone with John, you have some information on the actor that plays. So I thought when they walked out, I was like, did we pick uh, an episode of Mash on accident? I thought it was the guy from Mash. Yeah. You know, oh, I, a- <laughs> I kind of thought the same thing. You thought it was radar. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. Like, <laughs> Obviously, we, uh, who watches the most MASH here? <laughs> I have no comment on MASH, so I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> when we come back from the opening credits, we're at like a real janky airport. A plane's coming in to land. I, I have it written down as a rustic airport. <laughs> as the plane lands on the runway a whole bunch of people come running out of the bushes and when the plane comes to a stop we find out that it's the da working with Tubbs and crockett to bring down what's supposed to be a big time quote-unquote smack dealer yes, and this is a career bust because <laughs> when the three high school kids climb out of the plane they find the 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 two pounds of grass and the world is saved from drugs. <laughs> well, Tubbs and Crockett are having a good laugh at the DEA about it, too. Like, Tubbs... Is, t- Tubbs and everyone's says, just like, cool with sure Tubbs you're... rolling around with a sawed-off shotgun, too. Yeah, I kept, I kept thinking the way he was carrying that around, after they get done, they realize, like, oh, they're just high schoolers, and they're, like, walking away. He's just carrying it around like, like it's his purse or something <laughs> under his arm. It's like, hey, yeah. weird. Well, Tubbs is even having a good laugh. He, he says, it makes sure you arrest these boys for smoking in the boys' room, too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And another helicopter lands and it's full of press and so the dea thought this was going to be a huge bus so they had alerted the press to meet them at the at the airport too so that they can be there to cover this giant smack bust when that helicopter full of press lands 27 people get out of that <laughs> helicopter and go running across the, how, the tarmac how was that flying in the air like how was that not too much weight in that thing <laughs> I, I just thought it was funny like crockett starts going like telling one of the camera guys get that camera out of my face <laughs> well, he, I mean, he is an undercover cop, right? So he can't exactly be on the TV with by the bus. Like. At least he finally acknowledges it. Yeah, exactly. There was just, there were so many people that got out of the helicopter. It's like the music should have stopped and went. One of the reporters that gets out, it's Ira Stone, as we saw in the opening. 
He comes walking up to Crockett, and they immediately recognize each other. They hug. Even at the very beginning, it's yeah. kind of awkward between them two. Yeah, it is a little awkward. I don't know how you're supposed to act when you run into old war, war buddies. And <laughs> based on the two-second scene we saw before, I'm not even sure they were actually friends. True, and all Stone he has He seems say. like, like one of them Weasley little guys, too. <laughs> yeah, I know he is, right? Like, Turns out he is one of those Weasley little guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, Stone, all he has to say is that he specifically came on the helicopter to talk to Sonny. He was not there to cover that story. He came to talk to Sonny. He says he's got a line on a primo story, and then the only thing he says is, the sergeant lives. And then, after they walk away, Tubbs asks Crockett about the sergeant, and Sonny goes in to tell him about, like, there was this guy, he was smuggling heroin out, out of Nam in KIA bag, and Stone's been looking for him forever. Uh, Crockett in his story way, he explains it. He takes it very personal that they were using those body bags of soldiers who had sacrificed themselves for the country and then o- only to be used as drug mules to come back to the U.S. So, Sonny, it, it, as I mentioned, like, it was very awkward between Stone and Sonny and Tubbs, to his credit, throughout the whole episode, is skeptical around every corner. Yeah, exactly. He's like, I don't think this adds up right away. Mm-hmm. Hmm. He has a skeptical <laughs> eyes on. <laughs> <laughs> when we so from- they all decide to go out to lunch, you know, and it's a very lovely lunch. I mean, it looks like they have a they're, they're having an incredible time. <laughs> Sunny, it's kind of like yeah. a fancy hotel restaurant, too. Yeah, oh, yeah. Because they had, like, valet mm-hmm. parking. Yeah, I would imagine that there's a golf course out back. So all on, the, all on Miami Vice's dime, too, I'm sure. Oh, no, Stone pays for it, right? Yes, his his magazine was going to pay for it or whatever he said, or his editor or something. Mm-hmm. Meaning his future ex-wife paid for it, right, as, as we find out later. Yeah, and he wasn't as even... As we find out later. As we find out later, <laughs> he's not even staying at that fancy hotel. That's where he says he's staying, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Stone explains to Tubson Crockett that... Like, the, uh, he did bring it up to the army. The army investigated and only found one guy who had committed suicide. So they just kind of gave up on this track of chasing down the quote unquote sergeant. And that also a few weeks ago, a big shipment came in of heroin and it's been making everyone sick. It's been killing people because it's just a bad batch. And it's made out of like, I don't, I don't, I didn't write down the, like the scientific term that he called it. Who knows what the reality is of it? But he does say that it has methanol in it, which is what they say was used to preserve the bodies coming back from vietnam yeah they said it was wood grain alcohol and that's mm-hmm. what they were using to preserve so, the bodies my only problem with this is that this mastermind sneaks all this heroin out of nam into the states here we are what it's got to be at least 10 years later in miami mm-hmm. and this guy has sat on this heroin for 10 years and now he's gonna try and sell it and that's what stone that's what his conspiracy theory is he says he's been sitting on it waiting for the price to go up so now he's on a gold mine because he says a hamburger you cost 39 cents in 1975 so it's got to be more expensive now yeah Just, I, mean, I don't know i mean i, I don't know a lot of drug dealers with that much self-control where they can sit on it for 10 years. It tends to be risky to hold on to that quantity of heroin. Yeah, so they talk you about, tend to want to try and sell it right away. Yeah, they talk about how it just started happening, what, a year ago? That started coming back on the market and people gotten sick from it and stuff like that. They talk further on in the in the episode, they kind of explain that. But I don't want to get too far ahead. So. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of dinner, Crockett, I'm oh, sorry, but the last thing that happens at dinner is that Stone also just kind of drops him. I'm looking for this guy named Maynard. Uh, he's hoping that Crockett can help him find because he's a cop. And so he has Maynard lives in the Miami area. He was hoping that Crockett would be able to help him. And then at the end of their, their fancy lunch, brunch, dinner, whatever the hell time it is, <laughs> <laughs> Crockett says goodbye. They get in the car. Tubbs, well, he says, I don't like this. There's a few things that don't add up. And quote, I'm calling them like I see them. <laughs> <laughs> calls him like i see them <laughs> and then sunny says i shared some radical times with that guy in vietnam so that's his only justification for stone's behavior and weird story that doesn't make any sense is that they had some quote radical times together <laughs> Isn't that enough for you people? Thank God. (laughs) Just like to point out Sonny's track record and trusting his gut on people he knows from the Vietnam the Vietnam era of his life. I think we're about over nine right now. Why does he ever listen to Tubbs? Tubbs is always right. 
uh, no. when he's about a person. No, he's not. He's not always right. <laughs> because remember, well, unless he's trying to have sex with no, him. No. Yes. Because, because remember that episode with where we were like, why is this a surprise that this guy's sleeping with his daughter? Remember Tubbs was like, oh, she's just a rich, stuck up girl who got got on the drugs so so he, okay. he has missed one but he's no. at least batting above the mendoza line i'm like sunny <laughs> true yes true. yes yes we have a brief stopover at the precinct before we head over to the va hospital crock is just pleading with castillo to let him keep working on the case castillo eventually breaks down and says go get some info for him at the va let's don't do his job you do yours but i will point out just real fast the sunny says he's even willing to take a couple of days off to help stone out so he is, you know, every once in a while, he will burn up a couple of vacation times instead of just saying, instead of just doing whatever he wants to on Vice's time. <laughs> you know, one time he was trying to be a good <laughs> worker. <laughs> After we leave from the precinct, we head over to the VA and Stone and Crockett have gone over to talk to a, a man who's at the VA hospital and his friend had died, like was one of those... um uh, dirty heroin batches and so they've gone down there to go talk to him and find out where he made his buy so this is this scene is one that, that just it it bugs me a little bit with crockett because i mean he stands out so much like the scene begins and they're going through and there's all these vietnam vets and you see them all you know scraggly beard yeah, in wheelchairs three, three quarters of them are in wheelchairs yeah, and then it, it, it finally finishes panning across, and it ends with Sonny Crockett in his designer pants, <laughs> yeah. designer shoes, yeah. his perfect haircut. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like one of these is not like the other. <laughs> we'll say that none of them, none of them are happy that Stone and Crockett are there. They're especially mad at Stone. They keep trying to trying to say that he's just there to earn a cheap buck off of them for a, for a story about drugs and not covering how bad the VA hospital is or how, how they can't get the treatment. One guy goes into a story about how his the pin in his hip was too short, so that's why he's bound in his wheelchair. Crockett tells him that, because they're really coming out of heart, it's like, hey, it's my job to investigate street drugs killing someone i don't i understand you're upset but this is this is what my job is so back off him and stone leave and you can see it's really eating at crockett but he tells stone this is the way the battle is going to be because they're not going to trust you on this search because of all the other reasons why things are hard for vietnam veterans the one thing like the, the scene ends and the jan hammer background music for this episode just kills me <laughs> do, 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 do. you know like like it's just it's terrible i'm sorry jan i had to say it it is terrible it is so distracting and it doesn't fit with anything in the episode <laughs> we do have we have a real brief scene that we head to next and we might take a little bit more time on this just because it's it's a it's a setup i think that will lead to other things we see stone he's at a he's sitting out on like a patio area and there's a hotel worker that's standing next to him and she's not he very asks, happy about being there either no and he's having her call maynard's office first like dial it and then once it starts ringing hand it to him so that he can talk like she's his secretary yeah and dude and if you're gonna do that if you're gonna make a waitress or like a random maid make phone calls <laughs> and pretend to be your secretary you know tip him. <laughs> the worst part about it is that he's not even staying at that hotel no yeah he's just having <laughs> lunch there <laughs> yeah he leaves him he he tries to get all the maynard it's is he's not there, so he just leaves a message that says that he has an it, an interesting story to tell him. But this is all twelve like a hours setup, later. Right? They're on Crockett's boat. <laughs> 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 like, <laughs> like, suddenly it's dark out, and they're on his, uh, on Crockett's boat, telling war stories, and yep. he's sitting there like, "Cool story, bro." <laughs> and he hangs up the phone, and we jump out there. They're in the middle of the water. No ex explanation why they're just out in the middle of the water either. Like, no. like yeah, there's no we reason why lost, they're out there. Like, hours of time. <laughs> It's like he, that scene. he went to the laundromat and did a bunch of little errands and, and then and now we're to the important part just imagine it's like that scene in what's the chris farley movie where he's in the dinghy out on the lake oh it's tommy boy tommy boy yeah, yeah. especially yeah. that him and stone are out there and there's a couple kids on the shore yelling at him 
<laughs> yeah, there was no explanation for why they were out in the water. I thought at first they were just like the same thing, like in the dock or something. I'm like, oh, okay, they're just docked. And then all of a sudden, I'm like, wait, no, they're not because they have to like drive the boat really fast. Yeah. And then Sonny's telling these war so, stories. And then all of a sudden, Stone just yells, incoming! And <laughs> mortars start exploding around them. Yes. And I'm thinking like, are they both having a flashback simultaneously? Like, is <laughs> yeah. that what's happening here? I thought that too. When I first watched it, I was like, oh, so this is supposed to be like uh, symbolic or something, right? Like uh, yeah. what, what's Dude, it's, happening it's, here? No, it's, it's really happening. <laughs> Sonny's, tell, Sonny's telling the stories and he's he's got a little bit of a drunk thing going. And I mean, it's, it's a sad story. Yeah. But hey, that when guy was the killing dogs, start, okay? That's a really sad story. Yeah. <laughs> It's a really sad story, but when the bombs start going off, just the kind of the shock on his face and like the junk stumble to get to the, <laughs> the steering wheel. Well, this is another one of those scenes where it's it's like it's an apocalypse now clone because it's supposed to make you feel like you're in Vietnam, like that's the use of mortars. That's I mean that's it's weird. That someone would be shooting off mortars in the city of Miami, so it's totally Dude, a plot as, piece for it to be as someone as someone that lives. Where they shoot mortars over my house. <laughs> yeah. They are True. so loud. They are so loud that if he was firing mortars off, it would be shaking windows on buildings and cars. Like, like someone would have noticed homeboy shooting mortars off on the beach. This is just, it's director Don Johnson. He's, he's wants to make sure that you're, you know, he's making a statement about Vietnam. So of course the two Vietnam veterans have to escape in a Vietnam war style on the water, escaping from mortars being fired at them, which will come up again later at the end of the episode. At the, so I will say the last thing I'll say on this scene is at the very end of the scene, you see the man who's firing the mortars. And I will say he is very, <laughs> very, very ugly. Oh my he God. is an ugly man. He's like the <laughs> ugliest man there ever was. Those teeth. Oh my God. It's awful. I was just, they showed him and I was like, so wait a minute. He's being attacked by pirates? <laughs> Like, now I'm even more confused. Somewhere that guy's like, ouch, ouch. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the next morning, we're at the precinct. This is just real fast. Crockett's telling the story to the vice team. Castillo says, oh, sorry. Zito says he's che checking in on people at the VA. It's because Crockett thinks that they're after Stone. So Zito's checking in to people at the VA. Switek has a connection for quote unquote Laotian white. And so now we go to the best scene ever. Uh, <laughs> ever. <laughs> <this episode>. Yes. <laughs> well, sorry, because it comes off twice. So, so, so this is this, this, this uh, one, first. and then when they're back at the leather bar. Yeah, the leather bar is the yeah, best so, scene. Okay. So I missed Z, uh, the first part of Zito's explanation on this. Why is he dressed like a dominatrix? You mean, you know, I mean, Zito. Switek. Switek. Zwitek, sorry, Zwitek. Yeah. So Even they, worse. Why is the fat one dressed as a dominatrix? Because he already had the outfit at home. <laughs> he wears it. <laughs> Elvis suit, Elvis suit, Elvis yes. suit, leather bar, exactly. Elvis suit. <laughs> yeah. So we're over at this hotel and it's Tubbs and Zwitek. So a very odd pairing. And they're walking down this hallway. They're going to go visit someone. Tubbs is looking fantastic in his in his three piece suit. He's walking down. Switek, on the other hand, looks like he's about to go on stage with Judas Priest. <laughs> <laughs> he's got the hat. He's got gloves, the leather vest, no shirt underneath, chaps. I'm assuming they're assless chaps. Oh, <laughs> you don't God. see them from behind, but I'm God. just assuming. Never, never goes that low. <laughs> yeah, thank God for that. And Tubbs thinks it's hilarious. And the reason why Switek is dressed that way because his connection with the Laotian White, he says that he doesn't, Crockett's got all the high rollers cornered. So him and Zito have to improvise and work different angles. So Switek works leather bars. <laughs> and this is where he finds people who are selling drugs. Hey, someone has to do the hard so, stuff, okay? And that's it. We're in the leather so and going to those bars. <laughs> they get to the end of the hall. Switek knocks on the door. He says, we're here to see Harold. It's Zoom for a friend of Thumpers. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Which I think, I think that means that, do you think that means that um, Zito is Thumper? <laughs> That's Maybe. all I could think. I'm like, all I could think is that they go there together and they dress up. <laughs> I am interested to know when Switek and Zito <laughs> sat down and had their naming brainstorming session to come up with their undercover names for the other bar. <laughs> so, 
thumper. So it immediately. So I just want to get this rationale right. So because. Tubbs and Crockett have all of the high rollers. Rather than go to biker bars or regular bars, they determined they would go to leather bars. Like that's the next big jug hot spot. Is a, I think is what, a leather the, what bar. he's saying is they have they have to slum it to work everywhere. Everywhere, yeah. they have, to, and they have to come up and they have to come up with creative ideas on why, which is why they're mm-hmm. the bug men. You know, like why they have a bug van and uh-huh. why. Like, Mm -hmm. why did they, I don't know, Mm -hmm. pretend like they're janitors and, you know, stuff like that. Well, they go into the room and Harold is super strung out, basically on his deathbed. He's got some of the dirty heroin. Tubbs asks him where he scored. He says, at the end, and talk to Dakota. When we leave from Harold's apartment or hotel room, whatever it is, we have a brief stop over at Stone's place where he's on the phone setting up a buy with Dakota. So things kind of roll right along. Seems like they planned that out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. So next we have Stone and Crockett, and they're supposed to be on their way to go see Dakota. But Crockett says they're gonna make they're gonna stop off and because he found what they call what's his name? Sergeant Real Estate or Mr. Real Estate, Captain which is real estate. Captain, yeah, he's right. Yeah, there we go. He found Maynard. And so he's going to take Stone to go see Maynard. But Maynard's quick to say, I tried to talk to him this morning. He, everything was good. I don't need to talk to him again. He tries to check it out real fast. Oh, yeah. Which that was, that kind of raised the red flag right there. Like, oh, yeah, no, we don't need to go see him. Okay, I don't want you, Sonny Crockett, to go see him. Yeah, he got panicked. Yeah, which is right funny away. because he, he came to see Crockett to find him. It's like a high roller party that's going on. Stone and Crockett go walking to the back. It's a and- swingers party. There's a bowl full of keys somewhere. <laughs> they get to the back, and Maynard immediately recognizes Sonny. He comes walking over and shakes his hand, and surprise. Maynard is played by C. Gordon Liddy, who, like, literally just got out of prison, <laughs> like, maybe a few years ago. Yes. And is now playing a drug lord in Miami Vice. G. Surprise. Gordon Liddy, famous for being an army <laughs> lawyer who was basically Nixon's right-hand man when it came to wiretaps and illegal activities and was basically the criminal element of the Watergate case. And served the most time of anyone who was sentenced in that Watergate case, too. And clearly it's not a shame. Yeah, he was actually, he was sentenced. (laughs) He was actually sentenced to like 30 years, but his sentence was commuted on the four and a half years by the next president. And it is not lost on the Miami Vice, on Don Johnson or the filmographers on this episode of Miami Vice, because we go to Maynard's office where they go to talk and they pan the wall and they pan. It's like picture, picture, big picture of Richard Nixon. Picture pan to Maynard at his desk. Yeah, and even Stone's rant is really kind of ironic because he's really accusing him of being the sergeant. Essentially accusing him of being the sergeant, but basically accusing him of being the same type of criminal he was. He just got out of jail for being in real life. Yeah, exactly. And so Sonny thinks that this is going to be a normal conversation, and Stone just flips and starts yelling at him, and then storms out and Sonny tries to grab him on the way out and Stone says I made a mistake I shouldn't have brought you here I made the whole thing up and he just storms out and Sonny's just in shock he quits he basically throws a temper tantrum and says I'm I'm taking my recorder and going home yeah he says that he thought this story would have saved his career but he was wrong Maynard just walks up behind Sonny as Stone leaves and says maybe the war covered him Sonny walks out to the so front I, just oh. in time to see Stone stealing his Ferrari. Which I think he could have got in that yeah. car before it drove away. <laughs> that was the slowest drive away ever. He was like running alongside it. I'm like, just jump in it, Sonny. Get in the car. <laughs> the last thing we see on this scene, though, is we see that. We <laughs> that see this very man. awkward scene where Maynard just looks to his left and the ugly man <laughs> sticks we, his head <laughs> from behind the wall through a circle window and they just stare at each other for about 30 seconds. And that then we fade out. <laughs> and then we fade out and go back to the leather bar. <laughs> Good segue. <laughs> yes. Tubbs and Zwitek are back at the leather bar. Tubbs is talking to Dakota, who is played by Iman. Yeah, so it's this episode has she has quite guest star lineup. Oh uh, yeah. I mean, even even Stone 
Jones, played by Bob uh, Balaban, who been in just a ton of stuff. I mean, mostly as guests or guest appearances and stuff like that. He was in movies like Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Best in Show, and Gosford Park. And I specifically put those because he played bigger roles in those two movies. He was the narrator for Moonrise Kingdom. He was in Grand Budapest Hotel. What we were saying in prep, he was on five episodes of Seinfeld, where mm-hmm. he played the uh, president of NBC. Between Iman and Bob and Liddy, like yeah. this is this is actually a pretty deep episode when it comes to guest stars. But this scene at yeah, the Yeah, side note. Mm-hmm. A side note about Bob is that apparently his whole family, as far as his dad, his uncle, his grandfather, they were all pioneers of the movie industry way back in like the 20s and 30s. Yeah, so this scene at the leather bar is really important, though, because <laughs> Sorry. They, go into, they go into the bathroom. And Melissa, I'm going to let you sum this up with what this conversation is, because I was having a hard time throughout this whole episode. It felt like this episode was being played at one and a half speed. From what I can understand of that conversation, they go in there and he Tubbs is talking about that he wants to buy some Loatian drugs i don't know i gotta guess that's what they would call it and mm-hmm. she says that he says do you have like basically do you have a connection and she said i have a connection but i also have somebody else basically what she's saying is somebody else that wants to buy it and they're and they're saying oh so we're too late to the party you know so i text it's like we're too late to the party and we have but we have the money basically and so she's okay well then you can i'll, I'll set you up with my connection then and she says it's a journalist that's all i know is he's a journalist the her the other person that wants to buy it so they go then what are you going to do with the journalist she goes oh don't worry about him i'll take care of him myself which we know she doesn't yeah which whatever i don't know what that was about (laughs) who was going to take care of that guy that she was with (laughs) yeah i don't know i don't know but just the sad moment is that we just know this is the last time we see swytek in the leather yes that is very sad (laughs) the whole storyline with dakota is kind of stupid but it's kind of haphazardly thrown in there it feels like like they feel it feels like they needed to have her in an episode so like let's just throw her in this one it didn't make any sense though right like, well what's funny is that she plays this she plays a different character in another episode in an upcoming mm-hmm. episode yes she does so oh, she weird. plays two people yeah yeah they do that all the time though that's like that's a that's a yeah. vice thing <laughs> what gets me about this episode is that this is this almost uh, they almost scream like they're cops one guy dressed <laughs> stupidly in leather <laughs> and the other one acts li- uh, is acting like a cop. They go in. They literally kick everyone out of the bathroom by pretending that a uh, cop are followed him yeah. in. Yeah. Yeah. Why, if she is selling drugs, quantities of drugs, or if she's some sort of middleman, is she doing business in a bathroom stall with these two who she really doesn't know? Exactly. Mm-hmm. Like that, That's just like some cold call. Like they just came up to her at the bar, yeah. right? And said like, hey, yeah. I heard you are. The, you're she, deco- oh, no. He says I, I got your name from Harold. He's like a mutual mm-hmm. friend. So I guess that's probably why. Hi, I'm Zoom friend of Dumper. <laughs> 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 yes, exactly. Harry told me to come yeah. talk to you about heroin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Tubbs at the I wonder yeah. at the bar. Tubbs says like, hey, I, I heard about you through Harold. He told me that you were the person to see for the whatever the look. Keep calling it the Loatian. Then that guy starts hitting on my <laughs> tech. So. The the storyline is a mess. Things just don't match together because that's the next scene. It's like so Tubbs and Switek leave. They Sorry. leave from the bar, <laughs> and Switek vanishes, and Sunny teleports into Tubbs' car so they can have a conversation about why Crockett didn't tell him that Stone had contacted Dakota. <laughs> the only thing we get out of this is that Gina saw Sonny's car parked out at a hotel near the causeway, so that's where they're going. They show up to this hotel is significantly more run down and a pretty much a crap hole hotel. They go knock on the door and Stone's wife opens the door, get ready to leave, and she just says, Stone, he's a liar a junkie and a fool she's paid for everything that he wants to do she's leaving him forever now she doesn't know where he is they basically get nothing out of her except to know that stone is a is an idiot and a liar and so they need to go do some more investigation on him she's a real gem by the way well uh, i was gonna say but golf clap on stone for marrying it marrying above his uh, <laughs> oh, wait, his yeah. level cause... yeah exactly i mean she's <laughs> yeah, because Stone, I mean, he, he's probably well, well, like a five, you know, and she's definitely at least an eight. I mean, she's an eight, yeah. <laughs> might have to take off her for her personality, though. She's, uh, she's a little harsh. <laughs> <laughs> then we go back to the leather bar. Now, this time, Sonny is going to go with Tubbs. And this is great. 
<laughs> Dakota and a man are sitting at a little table and in come walking Tubbs and Crockett. The man says, who are you? And Crockett comes over and just kicks the fuck out of him and kicks him <laughs> over in his chair. <laughs> he just drop kicks him. <laughs> Tubbs grabs him by the neck and yeah. holds him down. Is that really necessary? Like, he just asked I- a question. <laughs> And then Sunny turns to Dakota, throws the table, uh, but she doesn't know who the actual source is, but that's who Stone is going to go meet. So now we're still on the same day. Switek has disappeared so, somewhere. I'm, for- I'm worried for him. I don't know where he went. <laughs> he might be stuck in that yeah. leather somewhere. <laughs> Bumper's not home to help him. How's he getting out of it? So what I love about this is I'm just trying to picture the the events of the episode as from Dakota's point of view. Some random <laughs> reporters trying to buy coke off of her or heroin, and then this really weird guy from some junkie she knows shows up with a black guy, and he tries to buy <laughs> drugs off her. <laughs> then these two the, the the black guy shows up with his with some strange white guy and they start beating the hell out of some <laughs> random dude at the club <laughs> and yelling at me it's like this has been the weirdest three days of my life <laughs> I didn't even think about that. Does it make? That's what my problem is with this episode. Is that so much of the story doesn't make any sense? <laughs> yeah, from Dakota's point of view, she has no idea about the Vietnam War connection or anything about that. She's sitting over there, it's just like a drug dealer. Like, what the fuck? They go straight over to the warehouse. Crockett like scales. He parkours up the wall <laughs> to get upstairs to go see what's happening. He doesn't see anything other than two people leave. Tubbs sees them come out of the warehouse and then they, the cars go in different directions. It's clearly Stone and Maynard. They follow Maynard, who they're not following. Very well. they're, they're in the van too from the first season. It's from the Bruce Willis episode. So I'm trying to blank on that episode name, but they crashed it in the very beginning of that one too. Cause this, The van this time has a similar fate. They are following. Maynard whips around the corner, goes around a garbage truck. The duo don't see the garbage truck smash into it. Maynard somehow gets out of his car, runs over, pulls the lever for the garbage truck to lift (laughs) the van up off the ground. They eventually climb out of the van and Maynard drives away. It's like something out of Benny Hill or something. (laughs) We can admit they're terrible drivers. They crash their car all the time. They're bad drivers. It's just... Sonny can only drive a boat, okay? He has one skill, and he's a wonderful <laughs> boat driver. <laughs> Not so hot on the car driving, though. <laughs> the only so, thing, I'll, last so, thing I'll point out in this in this scene is that Sonny says, Tubbs asks, so what's happening with Stone? Is he buying or selling? And Sonny says, quote, he's definitely selling. Selling out. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> All right, so as bad as it is that they hit the garbage truck, because they just, uh, the scene shows them, they just drive straight into it. You know, like, there was no veering or anything. But the, the scene in, and then it's like, oh, look, Stone's wife finally got that cab. Let's see. <laughs> yeah, she gets in the cab, and the ugly dude is driving the van, so that you know what's going to happen here. That, you uh, know what's going to happen, but, but that's all kill. I thought was, like, Stone's wife finally finally got that cab. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you don't feel bad about it. You're like, whatever, don't even warn her ass. <laughs> They're getting there. Then we have another odd scene. So, we go back to Sunny's boat, and Sunny's like looking through his old war pictures does, and stuff. They're, they're scrapbooking. <laughs> I will say it did a good job of showing like Sonny was highly regarded in the war because he's got all these medals out, all these like letters of recommendation, whatever that he's going through. He finds a picture of Maynard and shows it to Tubbs to confirm like that's who he saw. He says, yes, that was. And then Sonny explains who the sergeant, he kind of liked him when he was in the war and that he also believes that Stone is going to blackmail Maynard with the buy so that because he's broke. So he's going to try and blackmail him that he has all this information on that he knows who Maynard is. Yeah, so so essentially Stone is betraying him because he needs money for heroin. <laughs> yeah, apparently. Yeah, that's, a, that's the gist of it, yeah. Or I don't know if it was just because of the drugs or because, I don't know, whatever, like his his uh, his journalist career never took off. <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't think yeah. he was ever working for anybody. I think he's a liar. He's not even working for – he has no editor. We have one scene that's an important scene before we go to the final scene of the episode. The duo goes over to Maynard's house the next morning, and they're talking to his wife, and his wife – gives up a ridiculous amount of information. And Melissa, I'm going to have to lean on you again to explain what is going on here. (laughs) (laughs) I think what's going on is they go to her and they're trying to find Maynard. And they tracked her down as as his wife. And they go to her and she says, her husband had said, like, if 
Sonny Crockett comes. Yeah, I think it's his regular name, not his not mm-hmm. his uh, <laughs> his fake name. Uh, Sonny, if, if a person named this comes to me, comes to you and asks about me, you just tell them that you're. I was really worried about Stone. Mm-hmm. That I'm worried about our guy Stone or whatever. And then they ask him like, "Well, where is he?" Asking her, "Where is he? Where is he at? Do you know where he is?" And she says, "He went. On, he's one of those men, and they go fishing, but he's mm-hmm. on this private island. You can't get to it. You have to go. There's no phone, so you have to go out by boat." And then also she explains. They ask if he's alone, and she says. No, he's with our gardener, who is somebody that he brought over from Vietnam, who was in a Vietnam prison camp mm-hmm. for years. And a year ago, we got him out. Essentially, he bought them. He bought him from a prison camp. Mm-hmm. He brought the drugs with and him. And he brought the drugs with him. So that's what I was trying to say, John, when we were talking about it earlier. So that's why he he, did, he never had the drugs. Or he he, he like basically lied dormant oh. for a while. It wasn't until he got that yeah. guy out. And then he could have him here. That's why she said, oh, they're really close. Because... He has him do all the dirty work. He, he brought the drugs okay, with him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she even says they're so close that they're thinking about buying another one. <laughs> yeah, basically, yeah. Oh, they've helped out many throughout the years. She said, she, you know, mm-hmm. all while she plays tennis. So she tells them where they're, where he's at, and when he's with his gardener. So. And that he's See, worried about with stone. her taking up all to the face. Yes, that was pretty good though. <laughs> that was the best part of that scene. <laughs> So Tubbs and Crockett take off and they head down and they go get on Crockett's boat to go find Maynard. This scene might as well have the doors, this is the end, playing and Lawrence Fishburne running around on the boat with a purple flare. This is it straight out of Apocalypse Now. Because they're going down through the winding river. We see Maynard. He's there with Stone. And Stone is blackmailing him. He's saying that in 19 minutes, he's going to re- reveal who Maynard is. He's written up this article. He wants to get paid. And which means that Sonny was 100% right with what was going to happen. But Maynard says, no, I got your backup manuscript from your wife. And then tosses Stone his wedding ring and says, you finally got that divorce. And the divorce is final. That the ugly man made sure it was final. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, essentially, you don't f around with G. Gordon Liddy. G. Gordon <laughs> Liddy will kill your wife. <laughs> will kill you. <laughs> he will tape record you. He is not afraid. He's not messing around. <laughs> Tubbs and Crockett are wandering down, getting closer to Maynard. You see that Dude. among uh. <laughs> Who is the ugly man? No, he's just, just the ugly man. He has no name. <laughs> <laughs> he comes running along the shore, much like in Deliverance. He's following them <laughs> on. Sorry. The <laughs> 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 he goes running to Maynard and tells him that Tubbs and Crockett are on their way. And so then Maynard stands up. He tells him a story about the manuscript, tosses him the ring, stands up, shoots Stone three times in the chest. And then him and ugly man go running out into the woods or Everglades or jungle. Whatever, I don't somewhere. know what you call it out there in Florida. <laughs> Tubbs and Crockett, you know, they finally land the boat. They're a nice leisurely <laughs> boat ride down. They're going to pick a spot out for their picnic. <laughs> yeah, I just love how like, they're just kind of just chilling. They're just kind of cruising. Crockett's got the pole and he's pushing the boat. You know, they got the engine <laughs> off. Yeah, I know. Well, they're a in beautiful no hurry. day on the river. <laughs> <laughs> They go running up to the house and they see that Stone has been shot. He's sending looks them over and he says, you're hurt pretty bad, but you're going to be okay. And then they go out and go try and chase down Maynard. Well, it's a There's... good thing that Sonny's a doctor, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and then the music ramps up really loud <laughs> and Tubbs and Crockett go out into the jungle like Vietnam. Right, They're walking around. People are hidden. Maynard and the ugly man are hidden out in the, <laughs> in the woods. We watched so many bad movies. When that scene started, I kept expecting a ninja to jump out of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> that would have made it better, actually. Ninjas are going to come pop it out. <laughs> Ugly men should have been a ninja in disguise. <laughs> you know what? This is if if it wasn't for Vietnam, this is essentially the story of Miami Connection. Oh my god, it is. <laughs> oh. Wow. Oh my god, yeah. <laughs> Not enough motorcycles, but yes. <laughs> and John isn't in it, so you know. <laughs> <laughs> Crockett hears among take the safety off on his gun, shoot, he turns, shoots, and kills him. Rookie mistake, ugly man. <laughs> then they so go on the hunt. Did you just for survive 10 years in a prison <laughs> yes. camp only to die in a swamp in Miami? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's an F tough life right there. Then Tubbs and Crockett go on this manhunt for Maynard, and the music stops and is dead silent while they walk around for like. Five minutes. The longest stretch of no sound in the history of TV. 
And that's when you know you're not they're not gonna find him, right? It's like pfft, mm-hmm. they're not even really trying. <laughs> you know, and <laughs> they stopped. <laughs> you know, what's hilarious too is, is like all of a sudden you hinge into the boat kick on and they go running toward and you see a Maynard scooting away in the yeah, boat. He's not even going fast. You know? it's like, eh. <laughs> and my my thought is it's like, wait a minute. So why didn't someone just stay with the boats? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you not think that he could get off the island somehow? <laughs> yeah. They're all, they're all running through the weeds, falling through the weeds. And it's like, well, wait a minute. Either he's going to walk through the jungle or he's going to come back to the boat. I don't know. Because then they go back into the house and Stone's still alive. And Sonny puts his arms around him, puts a blanket over him and freeze frames. Shows he's a really good, shows he's a really good snuggler. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, blankets save you from dying when you're shot. You just wrap a blanket up and you're good. Yeah. Tubbs goes to call the, the medevac and then freeze frame episode ends. That's Maynard gets away. They didn't. The only thing they accomplished was to make sure Stone got killed. No, he doesn't die. There, Damn it. He's not dead. <laughs> there, their biggest mistake was at the end, they should have had Castillo with them. It's like a ninja. You better run around with a sword and then Bush just cut people up. <laughs> That is true. <laughs> I did think it was kind of weird that, got- that Castillo didn't really care about this story that much because, I mean, they talk about it all his other episodes where they talk about, like, before, after Vietnam. Like, so I think they try and insinuate that he was in the Vietnam War, too. So why wasn't he involved in this episode? Seems like he should be out there doing his ninja skills. <laughs> so that's the end of this episode. So let's go talk about the, the only band, I think, that's in this episode, which is The Doors. Uh, music is going to be one band specific. let's go talk about the music all right john i can't get over that this episode is essentially apocalypse now and so since even though the song's not even in the episode i've just been singing this is the end since i watched the Uh, episodes what do you got for me this week so yeah the this is basically this whole episode was a Doors greatest hits album i didn't even bother writing all the songs down because there's like eight Doors songs Every song in the episode's a Doors song. So we're just going to talk about the Doors. <laughs> the, the Doors were an American rock band from 1965 to 1973 that featured vocalist John Morrison, keyboardist Ray Manzarek, drummer John Densmore, and guitarist Robbie Krieger. The Doors are iconic in rock music. And because of Jim Morrison, I'm like, I'm like, isn't he just like a solo artist? I did, I always forget that there's the rest of the band behind him. <laughs> there's actually the Doors. <laughs> One thing, the band itself got its name from Huxley's book, The Doors <laughs> of Perception, which in itself is a reference to a William Blake quote. Oh. This is getting like an inception. Yes. <laughs> If the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is, infinite. That's where they came up with the name of the doors. The doors, man, they released eight total albums. All but one of them landed on the Billboard 200 Top 10. All but one of them went at least platinum, if not multi-platinum. Morrison met keyboardist Ray Manzarek at UCLA School of Theater, Film, and TV in July 1965. And kind of through Manzarek's connections with some of the local band scene, they they. Kinda Put together the band from there. John Dunsmore was a drummer for a different band, but they all kind of came together and uh, became the Doors. So, and Doors just blow up on the rock scene. Uh, but Jim Morrison had so many problems as far as alcohol and drugs and stuff that there's just, I could go on and name numerous times. He was actually the first lead singer to, or first musician to be arrested on stage. There no was a one whole had, bunch of his songs that he, that city police department said, you're not allowed to perform this live. This song is it's, it's too dirty, I guess. You know, it's a uh, uh, too controversial of a song, and you're not allowed to perform this. And they would do that, and then he would get arrested. Full of controversy and everything. Unfortunately, he would die July 3rd, 1971, in his Paris apartment. His girlfriend would actually find him in the bathtub in the morning. But because there's no aut- there was no autopsy performed, it's just listed as heart failure, though many suspect that he died of a drug overdose. He was buried in France 
in Poet's Corner of the cemetery, Pierre Lachasse Cemetery. I, I have no idea if I'm pronouncing that right at all. I'm not even going to. So what was crazy is that Morrison died at age 27. His girlfriend, Pamela, the one who found him, she would die also at age 27. Oh, weird. So she, she would go on. Pamela Corson would inherit Morrison's entire estate. So even though the two were never married, he had her listed in the will. So two mm-hmm. years later, she would die of a heroin overdose in her L.A. apartment in on the couch, not in the bathtub, though, because that would be weird. <laughs> yeah, it'd be too too close together. That'd be really weird. But yeah, she would die April 1974 at the age of 27 of a drug overdose. She was cremated. She lays to rest at Fair, Fairhaven Memorial Park. Bring that up because they have her listed there as Pamela Susan Morrison. Even though they were never married, she never had the last name Morrison. Where it gets even more complicated, so when she died... Her parents basically inherited Jim Morrison's estate. Weird. Yeah. That took a weird path. Yeah. And so weird that Jim Morrison's parents sued her parents. And after a long legal battle in 1979, they agreed to split the estate in half. So five years later. Weird that they had yes. to, that even that then they had to agree to split the, to split it in half. Yeah. yeah that's which, weird. I mean, I guess it makes sense that after Pamela inherited it, that it went mm-hmm. to her parents. But it just seems weird to me that Jim Morrison's parents had to sue Jim Morrison's uh, ex girlfriend's parents. Yeah. Get his, their estate back. Yeah, his estate back. Wow. Yeah, weird. Believe it or not, the doors didn't just disband when Jim Morrison died, like most people believe. Mm-hmm. They actually continued to be a band, perform as a trio until 1973. So for another two years. And then in 1973, they were Krieger and Dunsmar. And actually, I believe Manzarek was there for a little bit. were in London and they were auditioning people to try and replace Jim Morrison because Manzarek's uh, wife was pregnant. He decided to call off the the whole project and he went back to the states so krieger and dunsmar stayed in london and decided to call the project with the musicians they had gathered the butts band <laughs> okay yes <laughs> and so and they would record two albums between 1973 and 1975 and then the last little bit about the doors that you might not know but be interested in in 2002 manzarek and, Kr- and krieger tried to st- but basically start the doors up again. They wanted to start mm-hmm. playing again and they wanted to call themselves the doors of the 21st century. Just rolls right off the tongue. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Dunsmore didn't want to be a part of the project and Dunsmore and Morrison's estate sued Manzarek and Krieger for trying to use the name, the doors. Mm-hmm. They would briefly perform as writers on the storm before settling on the name Manzarek and Krieger, which is a little <laughs> on the nose. <laughs> yeah. so just one thing to point out, and I don't know if Jim Morrison's parents were still alive in 2002, but the whoever owned the Morrison state, like, he effed up, man. Not even going to let the band members use the doors again, huh? Yeah, that is a little harsh, but they had a better name. They just used their names. It's just, you know. I, re- I, I recognize know why those names. <laughs> why did they just stay with Riders on the Storm? I don't know. Because this is a Doors only episode, I would not want to take a moment because I, I know all three of us are big Doors fans. And they did songs like Hello, I Love You, Light My Fire, People Are Strange, Love Me Two Times, Riders on the Storm, Break On Through, Touch Me, LA Woman. John, what is your favorite song out of that from the Doors? Oh, God. I've always been a fan of Riders on the Storm. It probably would have to be probably L.A. Woman or Riders on the Storm. What about you, Melissa? Mine's going to be funny. (laughs) People are strange. Oh, hey. I love that See, song. I, I, I love was, that song. I was thinking about that. I was thinking about that. It's like I, I always like people are strange. I mean, too, I can sing I that like, whole oh. song. I know all the lyrics to that. I think that's why I like it. So that thing, if that comes on, yeah. I'm rocking it. <laughs> I would say mine's like a tie between "Light My Fire" and "Lover Madly." Oh, that's um, a good with, one. Yeah, good with one. "Lover Madly," probably my favorite one from the Doors. Yeah, yeah. that one's good. Well. Uh, I guess music was simple this time, John, compared to last week. <laughs> but, of course, it's a Hall of Fame, one of the greatest rock bands in the history of rock. Let's uh, let's go over and go finish up this episode and talk about our final thoughts. 
Okay, guys, I'll start off this week. This episode was a mess. There's a bunch of subplots that go nowhere. Storylines that don't make any sense. People just magically appearing in places like the time where Switek disappears and Crockett all of a sudden just appears. The scene where they're out in the middle of the water for no reason and people start, and someone starts shooting mortars at them. There's just so much that's a mess. I am not, I did not like this episode. I have been pretty consistent for like 30 straight episodes where I've loved just about or liked at least every single episode of Miami Vice. But this one, this one was just bad. I see what Don Johnson's director vision is in there about making it feel like at times like they're back in the Vietnam War and so really trying to highlight these veterans and how they can never escape it kind of then giving the viewer a feel like that Vietnam War feel. I understand that but this episode was just a mess. There's a bunch of stuff that didn't make any sense. Scenes that went nowhere. That whole night where they go from the leather bar to the warehouse and I don't know. It was just a mess. I was not a fan of this episode. Although the guest stars were good. So um, I didn't like this episode, and uh, I think I don't think I'm the only one who thought that. John, what are your final thoughts? Uh, you know, I thought it wasn't good, but it wasn't bad. It was okay. It, it was an okay episode. I still have a hard time, and I think I'm always going to have a hard time, and mostly because of how he dresses, believing uh, Sonny Crockett, the character, is a Vietnam War vet. Just a little too clean cut for me, but I don't know. I felt like the story was kind of there. I saw what they were trying to do with the Vietnam War stuff, and I can appreciate the gravity of the Vietnam War stuff. Like so, mm-hmm. like the story he tells on the boat about the guy killing the dogs, and at times it was confusing and it jumped around. That's why I'm. That's why I said it was. It was okay. It wasn't great. Be honest. It would have been a better episode if it would have been Castillo centric instead of Crockett centric. Even though he's the Vietnam War vet, this seemed like it was more of an off the books episode. So it mm-hmm. seemed like it should have been. It seemed like they have a similar history in that, and so it would have fit better. Yeah, it was okay wasn't good it wasn't bad it was just okay melissa what are your final thoughts i have a similar thinking to you dominic that it's not it's definitely not one of my favorite episodes i feel like there just wasn't enough thought put into it it was really rushed and everything is you have to like take in a lot of information right away i feel like it doesn't do the vietnam war justice i didn't feel any sympathy or like any connection to those the soldiers you know to the, when they're talking to him at the va shouldn't mm-hmm. that be like an emotional moment in the show or you know what i mean where you should feel something where they're talking about like that guy who's in the wheelchair and nobody cares about them and i just felt like it was rushed and it was i don't know how to say it and i i can't, I can't explain it almost like um there, there was no like they wanted people to feel sympathy for it but it wasn't actually there so mm. like phony mm-hmm. i guess that's what i'm saying like i felt really phony i agree with john mm-hmm. like it doesn't feel like crockett should have has been yep. in the war or he doesn't act like it, I guess. And I don't know if that comes from them just not knowing how to do it or what that is. But it feels phony. Like, it's like fake, you know, fake mm-hmm. sympathy, fake. Yeah. Like, f- like they were trying to get an Emmy out of that episode or something. <laughs> this is the one we're going <laughs> to yeah, submit yeah. for the Golden Globe or the Emmy, you know. <laughs> yeah, I almost felt like they should have just left Sonny being a former football star and, and made someone else be the the Vietnam vet. Because it just his character just never seemed believable. As a Vietnam yeah, it doesn't vet. because it never comes up, right? Like in his real life, his day to day life, like yeah. occasionally it's like thrown out there, like here you go, you know. And there will be episodes further on where they talk about it more, and then it then it becomes like it is a problem for Sonny, but he just doesn't act like it is. So I guess that's mm-hmm. what it is. Maybe he just hides it really well, and that's what they're trying to say. Like, hey, these people can be regular people and go about their lives even though they went to war. So, but mm-hmm. yeah, that's my thoughts. It, it just feels like it just hit it missed the mark that they were going for. They were going for like an emotion that you know, some emotion and sympathy and we and I didn't get it out of that. We had our first episode in quite a while where we were we were a little hard on it. It wasn't our favorite episode, but uh have no fear. There's always next week with the Miami Vice and I will take it if we ever get Switek back in leather, it was worth it. This whole tr- this whole episode was worth it. <laughs> hey, at least the soundtrack was amazing. True. True. Well, that's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Buy Me Advice. You can check out all the notes on the show and see the ways that you can subscribe on our website, GoWithTheHeat.com. Click on subscribe. you find out where our YouTube channel, Stitcher, iTunes, Google Play. You can pretty much find us anywhere. We'd love to hear from you. Go with the heat at gmail.com. If you're subscribing to leave us a review, that's how more people can find the show. That's how we can find out. Maybe we can get a little bit better or there's some things that you would like to see in the show. Go ahead and write that review. That way more people can find us on your podcast 
platform of choice. Or you can contact us directly, as I mentioned, go with the heat at gmail.com. That's going to do it for us this week, and we'll see you all next time. Bye, pals.